Hello and welcome to the AV Forums TV display and calibration podcast for Monday, the 11th of March, 2024, one day before my 50th birthday. Uh, welcome along to the podcast. As always, I have my guests here this week, and this week we've got Dr. Julian Scott. Hello, Dr. Hi, Phil. Hi, Phil. Uh, and we've always got Martin Jew. Hello, Martin. Hello. hello. Uh, was that, was that the Scottish lilt there, was that, Martin? <laughs> <laughs> Sound you like it. Sound you like it. <laughs> Uh, so what are we doing this week on the TV Display and Calibration podcast? Well, we are asking a question. Um, is now the best time to go and buy a TV? And should you buy last year's TV over the upcoming models that are due to come out through the spring and summer? Um, is it worth saving a few quid? We're going to answer that question a little bit later on. Also, just to remind you, we're no longer live streaming these podcasts. They are pre-recorded. Uh, if you have any questions and comments, and we do uh, answer your questions, uh, then you can send them to podcast at avforums.com on the email, or the easiest way is to find this podcast on the forum. Uh, so go to AV Forums, find the forum list, go all the way to the bottom, you'll see the podcast forum, just find this episode and add your question there. If you're not a member, you'll need to sign in and create a membership, but that's a nice, easy two-minute job uh, to do that. Or, of course, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, then you can leave your question in the comments down below. Uh, if you do watch the YouTube version, then do uh, remember that this is not available on the main AV Forums channel. These podcasts have moved to their own dedicated channels, AV Forums Podcasts. Uh, so head over to YouTube and subscribe to that channel so you don't miss any of our podcasts if you enjoy watching the video versions um, of those. Um, and of course, you know, we are AV Forum, so who are we? Well, we are one of the largest AV and hi-fi communities on the web, and we've been around since 2000, and our editorial reviews and everything else started in 2003. And so we create content for you, and uh, we're here to answer your questions, give you honest, accurate, and unbiased advice. And my name's Phil Hinton. I'm the editor of the site. We have been since 2003, done over 20 years on AV Forums. Um, I'm ISF, THX, and PVA. Uh, trained and certified and qualified and signed off and all the rest of it. And uh, I do the reviews on the site and make the videos as well. So uh, also on the podcast today is Jules. So Jules, give us a brief introduction. Yeah, uh, Phil, I've been a calibrator since 2011. Uh, THX seems to be a theme today with Martin's hat. Um, so I became a THX certified calibrator back then. And now PVA, uh, Professional Video Alliance uh, instructor as well. I do audio calibrations and travel I wouldn't say the globe, but uh, travel around Europe. Just come back from Andorra, for which is a very nice, fine trip indeed. So that's okay. me. And we also have Martin. So Martin, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, well, I started in the industry back in the mid-90s. I actually went out to San Francisco and got a job with uh, Lucasfilm Limited, their THX division. And uh, I used to run their global home THX certified training programs and then moved into the pro side of the business for cinema licensing. I then, after about nine years there, I then moved to LA for many years and worked for NEC Corporation, but I'd moved completely over to pro at that point because I was in business development for our own 2K made uh, projectors for cinemas. Uh, in the last uh, six or seven years, I've been predominantly a AV and professional cinema journalist, and I also consult to a couple of manufacturers as well, but all in the home arena. Okay, so uh, that's who we are, and of course we're here for you. We're enthusiastic at the end of the day. We love this subject just as much as you do, and hopefully we can impart some of our knowledge today on the podcast. And if you do have your questions, then of course we've told you how to uh, get them into us. Now, before we go and answer some of your questions from the last uh, TV and display podcast, we've got current competitions. Jules, tell us about those. Yeah, absolutely. You can win a pair of Q-Acoustics M40 powered speakers worth £749, courtesy of Peter Tyson. These ultra compact micro tower speakers, speakers feature Even? two times 100 watts of built-in amplification, the C-cubed continuous curved con mid bass driver, uh, high resolution wireless streaming via Bluetooth 5 with aptX HD numerous connectivity options for most sound sources such as a TV turntable needs a built-in preamp games console set top box CD player network streamer and this closes at 2359 on Monday the April 1st that's a and cracking price and there's a it there is. is a review on the homepage as well so yeah go and check the review 
And you can also win a Valencia Tuscany XL Ultimate Luxury Onyx Cinema Seat worth over £2,200. Valencia Seating has provided this superb prize design to elevate your movie watching journey to unparalleled heights. And that closes on the at 23.59 on Saturday, March the 30th. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, good competitions prizes. galore. Yeah, they are. They're very, very good prizes. avforums.com forward slash competitions to enter those. Uh, competition is open to all eligible AV forums members over 18, and you need to be resident in the UK. Uh, there's no previous winners. Uh, we do have a new patron, and uh, a few people have bought us a coffee, so why don't you tell us about them, Martin? Uh, yes, new patrons. Excuse me while I look over to my other monitor, but our new patron is Jaimeen Desai and uh, bought us a coffee, thank you very much. At Chojin, we've got Aqua Dulce and Mr. Black 79. Thank you very much for your support, guys. It really is appreciated. Um, thanks for doing that. It helps us improve our editorial, and maybe one day we'll do a good podcast. No promises, but maybe one day. So moving on to your Q&A. So some of these uh, questions came from the last podcast, which was on the 12th of February. Uh, Murphy says... I think it would be brilliant if you stick with the perfect, the perfect TV as the podcast master title and the theme of these podcasts. Um, good suggestion. Um, we we may take that under consideration. Um, but yeah, um, if you could go into more technical detail, and don't worry if you're not keeping it simple because the audience are proper TV geeks. Uh, we will go into uh, detail, but we will also try and uh, make sure that it is accessible uh, to people who want to get involved in this hobby. Um, sometimes. If you go too technical, it can scare some people away and then they're scared to ask questions. We don't want that. We want everybody uh, included in this. We want it to be inclusive. So we will go into detail. We'll cover technical details, but we'll try and make it nice and simple and easy to follow as well. And, uh, you know, get everybody involved and hopefully answer everybody's questions. But thank you very much, Murphy, for uh, for your question. there. And then you gave us a whole list of um things that you'd like us to cover. Um, I'm not going to go through them right now, but most of, in fact, all of the 11 items that you listed there, uh, we will no doubt cover those because they uh, are popular subjects that we will get into. Uh, Toonami says, one request for making these presentations, plenty of demonstrations and examples would be appreciated. So Toonami's talking about uh, tutorial videos that we are going to make this year and some of the guides into how to use your equipment. Absolutely, we are going to shoot video. We'll show you exactly um, all the steps that you have to take uh, to make sure that you can do the things that we're going to show you how to do. So don't worry about that, Toonami. We've got you covered there. Right, Julian, do you want to do the next two? Because it, it was uh, a question poised uh -huh. to yourself. Sure. Yeah, Jacito77 says in another podcast last year, Jules mentioned about TV electronics components drifting over time. So professionally, previously calibrated TV should be recalibrated after a while, like a car going to MOT. If I only use the filmmaker mode in a TV, could resetting it to factory mode and then to use the filmmaker mode again be comparable to recalibrating it? And uh, we have actually a reply to this directly, uh, continuing the, the THX theme. Uh, THX 1138 UK replies, a factory reset can't fix this only a full recalibration that measures the actual output of your particular TV, which then compensates for these unique changes can address the problem. However, this aging effect may be very subtle, especially on a modern TV. If you watch in filmmaker mode, then the image will be substantially less saturated and dimmer than a TV that's always used in vivid mode, and this will slow the picture deterioration. Uh, it, it is absolutely correct to say that just resetting your TV and then you know, going back to film makeout doesn't fix this. It's an aging of the panel itself um, that can only be uh, addressed with a, a full recalibration. Um, so however long you want to leave that, you know, it's, it's just kind of a, how long is a piece of string. And that sometimes comes down to money considerations as well. Uh, certainly, you know, in professional grading studio situations, we're calibrating regularly, sometimes, you know, every two months, uh, at least before every, every new season. Um, just because we are color critical and we want to make sure it's absolutely bang on every time we're doing uh, a new, new content. Um, so uh, so I think that sort of covers that, doesn't it? You... Yep, I think so. Yep. Uh, interesting what you say there about yep. studios because I, I was being told um, something just this week, actually, I'm not going to yep. divulge um, where the information came from on the studio in question, but when they, uh, when they green light a project nowadays, uh, they have a, a whole uh, itinerary list and they go and buy everything brand new. Wow. Um, there's no hiring of equipment. There's no uh, using uh, equipment that already exists. They want a complete 
fresh slate with every uh, show that they commission. Wow. So that I thought have that they got an e-bike good. side? Well, maybe <laughs> you know, they're going to have to get rid of the, the kit. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, um, that is seemingly um, a major studio does do that on every green light. Um, they will have an itinerary of everything has to be brand new, so it's a wow. clean slate. So there you go. Stuart, I think you said, sorry, I think you said in a previous podcast that as a general rule, two years was quite good, wasn't it, for a consumer to consider getting a recalibration done? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, it's, it's, it's difficult to say, you know, depending on make or model, when something is going to be beneficial, you know, a recalibration is beneficial. It all, it all depends sometimes upon the mentality of the owner. Um, you know, I do have guys... I have people who who want to have their like a like a, a car MOT every single year. Book book you back in again. Uh, let's do this time this time next year. Make sure everything is still good. And if the drift is very marginal and you can't even see it, they're still happy because they've had it verified. So it, it you know and and that's often the case again with post production too. Um, um, although you have the added complication in most production that a lot of grading monitors have knobs on the front of them for contrast and brightness and really critical features. And it's very easy for them to get knocked or somebody comes along and tweaks. And so you'd want to make sure um, that everything's still accurate from that point of view. But, you know, and this might might also tie into the results of the polls that have been running, AV forums have been running on sort of how often do you buy a new tv as well because some people's mentality as well you know i won't see them for another five years until they buy a new tv and they'll get that calibrated as well so it comes down to cost too um and so but um i i, I would you know i'd say you you get good value of it uh, every two years at least yeah and of course with modern electronics as well um you know these these drifts the component drift that used to be 10 percent the allowance um You'll be lucky if it's two or three percent these days, uh -huh. um, just just with the way that components are nowadays, and you know, they've managed to improve that. So hopefully that answers all the questions. And like I say, if you've got questions for us, uh, you want to get involved in our discussion today and give us your points of view uh, on that, then of course head over to avforums.com. Go to the forums, go all the way down the bottom, find the podcast, and then find this podcast. Ask a question. Or if you're watching on YouTube, it's down below. Or if you're really old fashioned, you could email us at podcast at avforums.com. Right. So let's move on to today's show and today's subject. And it's our TV buyer's guide. Now you're going to see lots of uh, this kind of content on EV forums going forward this year and because it's our job really I think to give you the best possible information when it comes to uh, potential purchases and so on we won't tell you what to buy and we keep banging on about this but we'll say it again we've already mentioned today uh, there is no such thing as a perfect TV in general but there is a perfect TV for you um, you need to decide what your use case is what you need the TV for what what you're looking for in terms of features and then buying the TV that best fits your use case. And that'll be the perfect TV for you. And there's lots of models out there. It can get incredibly confusing for um, a lot of people, mainly for a lot of people who have been maybe in a way for five years because they haven't needed a TV and they've been happy with what they have. And then all of a sudden it goes pop or they decide that they want to upgrade their TV to the latest and greatest. And technology moves very quickly in five years, Jules. Um, so... You know, where were you five years ago in terms of TV? Can you remember what technology you had at that moment in time? Yeah, absolutely. It was, uh, I think it was a oh, five years now. It was, what is it, 2024? So uh, it's 2019. So I had a, probably had a B8 at that point. Um, okay, an LG. Something like yeah. that, LG. And before that, I had a B7. Um, and I've got a C1. I yeah. guess it's probably time at some point. I haven't told, told my wife yet. So she's not watching uh, in the <laughs> other room. Um, but maybe I should be looking at uh, upgrading soon. Yep. Okay. I guess as a TV reviewer, I'm caught in this bubble where um, I have to keep reminding myself, and I do do this, but I have to keep mm. reminding myself how much these things actually cost. Mm. So put myself in that mindset, am I actually going to go and buy this product? And if I was, you know, what is the value for money? Um, and the other thing is I see all the new TVs and I see them every year. And like we say, people don't buy a TV every year. Well, there's a very small, probably 0.07% of the population out there and that's a complete and utter guess but then 70 percent of statistics are just made up on the spot anyway um there's probably a very very small niche out there who do buy their tv based on new technology and new improvements and so on um a lot of those people are on navy forums but most people tend to take a couple of years before they jump and, and go to the next tv so the thing is and this is the question for today's podcast 
do you wait for the 2024 models to come along? Um, now, the 2024 models are excellent. I've seen a handful of them already. Um, some of them I, I can't talk about at the minute because um, I've seen them in uh, environments which I've had no control over. So I don't want to give you an opinion on that because it's been under somebody else's control. But I have had an opportunity to see uh, these models that are coming this year and they do look great. But they're incremental differences compared to last year's uh -huh. models. Um, no one I can talk about is the G4. It was announced at CES. We know quite a bit about that TV compared to last year's G3 from LG. So this is their flagship TV. It has a new processor. And some people in the comments told me off because I didn't go into any great detail of how great this processor is. But these people in the comments, with all due respect, haven't seen this TV or the, or the processor that's going on the marketing that, that they've seen. Um, there are slight differences between the models in terms of picture quality, but actually, um, you know, is that the, it worth the jump in price that you're going to pay for a brand new TV? Um, Jules, if you were in the market right now, would you hang on for a 2024 TV? Because you have, I don't know, maybe you've got FOMO, you know, the, the fear of missing out. Um, do you have to have the latest and greatest or are you a little bit more laid back in your approach, you know what you want and you're going to find it no matter how old that set is. I suppose it comes down to that old chestnut feels, you know, is money no object? Uh, because you're going to be paying a premium price, yeah. at, you know, at launch. Um, and if you waited, say, to, to Black Friday, that TV is going to be reduced significantly in price, you know. So do you need the latest and greatest? Or you, can you wait a few months until it's a more reasonable price and I do find a lot of the the people I calibrate for do 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 that. You know, they they do wait until you know uh, Black Friday or the New Year sales. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, there are people who um, are at that point where maybe have had a TV for four or five years and they're swapping out for a new one, and um, they are you know willing to pay the extra. Um, so you know, in terms of the calibrations, I see. There is a crop of calibrations at the launch of the TV where somebody's paid the full price, but equally there's also a, a big a big sort of surge of calibrations towards the end of the year when the sales come around as well. So I think we can you know um, divide the uh, the clientele in, into those two categories, and often it's depending on you know how much disposable cash somebody's got. Mm. And Martin, for you, would you go and wait for the the latest, or would you give it some time? Uh, not with flat panel displays, actually, nor with projectors. I tend to wait for technologies to bed in and then buy second or third generation. I'm quite happy to do uh, do it that way as well. Yeah. And in fact, even in the States, um, my TV in LA for almost the entire time that I was there was a professional grade NEC plasma display, 61 inches. And uh, I loved that TV and I didn't feel much um, compunction to change it, even though everything moved to, well, that TV was a WXGA, I think. So it was 1366 pixels across the top, but it yeah. looked fantastic with HD DVD and Blu-ray. So I just hung on to it and I love the warm yeah. picture of it. Excellent. So I guess um, if you want the latest and greatest and, and you really need uh, to have that TV and there are some of us out there who who are that way inclined and just want the best and we want it right now as soon as it's launched then of course you can go and jump in there um, I guess the advice that we'd give I think all three of us is that um, go to AV forums um, the, you will find that people will go out and buy these sets new as Jules has just said and they'll get them calibrated and so on uh, but as the, the months roll in more and more people buy these TVs and what you'll tend to find is that in the owner's threads over at AV Forums, you will get genuine feedback um, from people who've gone out and spent their own hard-earned money uh, on these TVs and used them in their own homes. Now, they might not be using them in calibrated mode. Some of them might be shoving them into Vivid or have the image smoothing on and so on, and just bear that in mind when they're talking about picture quality. If you want to find out a bit more, then that's the pertinent questions to be asking them. You know, how is your TV set up and so on? But they're more than willing to tell you that, and it gives you a good... Uh, indication of how these TVs, mass-produced products, actually perform in people's homes. And, of course, we will review the products as soon as they come out, but I don't expect people to go and buy um, TVs on the back of just a review. You know, that's part of, should be part of your uh, process when it comes to buying a product is do your research, read the reviews, 
don't just read AV Forums reviews. There's lots of reviews out there. Like I say, um, get a good handle on the product. Um, you'll know that you're getting objective data from our reviews and you're getting an honest uh, uh, assessment of the product without any uh, emotion attached to that in terms of, you know, you must go and buy this product. We we never use language like that and so on. But, you know, build up your, your picture of what you want. And I guess, Jules, six months is, is, is not too long to wait and then make the decision as, as to whether you're going to jump on this new model or go for last year's, which, you know, will be still probably still available and, and a lot cheaper yeah absolutely and the other thing is you know there's something called the summer um which you know <laughs> not, in, not in the uk there's not. No, 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 not no not here this is as good as it gets isn't it right now um but um yeah and i mean like if, you, if you've got product launches around april may time then you've got the summer and and you know people are out enjoying themselves and they're in the cinemas less. Um, so I guess, you know, um, a lot of people will enjoy that and then, then come back to purchasing sort of autumn, uh, into, into winter time and you get that sort of burst around black Friday. So, um, th there are definite for me, at least, you know, in terms of activity for calibrations, you know, going alongside purchases, there are those two, two periods right at the very beginning when the products launched, you get the people who want, want the very latest and the greatest. And then the others who are uh, happy to uh, wait until the sales later in the year. Um, so you get that crop of calibrations around then reflecting purchases too. So, um, and of course, the other thing is, you know, when a product's new, it, you know, you're going to, you might have some teething troubles with it as well. So by, by the time you wait six, seven months, hopefully, you know, um, the, you know, any, any troubles have been sort of dealt with, with yeah. some firmware updates, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so there may be a benefit there to waiting a little time or two. Yeah. If there's serious issues, they'll normally pick up in the review. Yeah. I'll, I'll normally pick those up within the first couple of weeks of, of looking at a product. Um, but there are those that, um, and maybe intermittent or issues that are seen with particular setups, um, certain kit that's connected to the TV. Sometimes it causes issues with uh, e arc and so on. And, and these are things that you just can't test for um, in in a review. You know, you've got a product for a set time. Uh -huh. um, we get all the objective data that we can. We check what the products like out of the box and then calibrated and so on. But at the end of the day, we can't check every console, every sound bar, every uh, permutation of of setup. Um, so that's where the owner's threads really come in handy on AV forums. You know, you're, you're getting people who actually go out and buy the products and they will be using the, the, the same product, but in completely different ways, um, Martin, won't they? Yeah, totally. And um, well, and it, before I started writing for AV forums, I used to use it as a resource frequently, uh, particularly with things like what you've just mentioned with things like HDMI compatibility. And if you've got a certain, let's say, uh, Blu-ray player or certain receiver and you're connected by whatever means to your display, um, there are a lot of things you've got to be aware of. What are those optimum settings for those uh, devices which are connected? And for that reason, uh, yeah, I mean, I would, uh, with bias as well, say that AV Forums is possibly the greatest resource in the world for that, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, Martin, um, you know, being a calibrator for many years, I would check the AV forums review before going out to calibrate because, you know, Phil's going to see those TVs before I do it because he's a reviewer. So the first time I'll, I'll encounter them and get my hands on them to calibrate will be in somebody's front room. Um, so having that, you know, that detailed review um, uh, and, you know, just big up to to the AV forums reviews. Um, they, they are giving a level of detail that a lot of other review sites, you know, don't give anymore. Um, so, um, it, you know, it's a very, it's always been very, hand, very useful, a resource, um, prior to going out. Um, but as you say, you know, with the different combinations of equipment, some things just can't get flagged up until they're out into mass market and people are testing it with all sorts of different combinations. Um, so, um, there may be some benefit to uh, waiting a little while before, before purchasing, but, uh, yeah. also a big up to those, to those guinea pigs that are getting it first. Yeah. Um, how much am I writing on this check, Jules? <laughs> the copy thanks, for the, thanks for those comments. I, no, it is appreciated. But yeah, I mean, we all have a, a you know, I, I can get to see these ni things nice and early. Um, we've got a good deal with with uh, some uh, retailers as well. So it's not necessarily man manufacturer supplied 
units we're looking at as well. We're looking at actual retail units. As soon as they hit the store, we can get them in and have a look at them. So that's important. But I think the other thing um, that sometimes we forget, and certainly I forget sometimes as as a as a reviewer and probably yourself as a calibrator, Jules, is mm. is the language that we use. And this is another thing that we're looking at this year in terms of our content on AV forums and so on is. It, is it inclusive? Is it accessible? Um, are we being too technical sometimes and scaring people away when they come to to look at um, these products or they want to find out a little bit more? So I guess, you know, when you look on the forums, there is, you, you're going to find these two camps, Martin, where you're going to have the technical users who know what they're talking about and who will, you know, interact in a thread um, on a regular basis. And then you'll have those who, are maybe scared to ask a question in case they they think it's a, a silly question to ask on such a technical thread. And and really, people shouldn't be put off, should they? No, definitely not. And actually, I get comments under some of my reviews, and it amazes me. I mean, some of the people who are making the comments are clearly, uh, you know, you know, some of them are at sort of engineer level, and some of them are clearly novices as well. But I like to feel that uh, in my reviews, I hope I get the balance just about right. I mean, I think part of the key is to write in hopefully as simple English as possible and uh, let the technical bits do for um, for itself. Um, but yes, it is a bit of a challenge getting that right. Um, but yes, I mean, I, I hope and I think we strike quite a good balance. I mean, there are other websites that go into a lot more depth, but... I can only imagine that their audience is much smaller as well. Yeah. So, you know, this is where you as a listener or a viewer, you know, your input uh, becomes very uh, handy to us uh, and important to us. You know, where is the pitch? Where do you think things are? And, and again, ask those questions. Um, if you think that we uh, we are not covering certain areas, let us know. Um, and if the language is wrong, let us know. Uh, because at the end of the day, we do this for you we don't do it for for anybody else um we don't do it for manufacturers we don't do it for uh anything like that we, it's for end users at the end of the day and, and jules all we want is a good product um you know we appreciate it's a business um these manufacturers need to make money there is going to be a a, a whole other market and it's attached to these things and again that can confuse um so getting information across and the right information is important Absolutely. Uh, you know, AV forums will have a huge catchment area of people with different um, technical backgrounds and ability to understand things as well. So it has to be accessible at the same time. It, you know, it has to give people who are, you know, on the, the more geeky end of the scale, that uh, ability to, to dive dive into the weeds. Um, so, it, you know, it's a difficult balance to 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 hit, isn't it? But um you know, I I joined Davy Four back in two thousand and four, and you know, and that seems what's that twenty years ago now. Mm. So, and I've seen the the evolution of of the forum um, from its very beginning. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was all fields here back then, wasn't it? It was all fields. <laughs> but, but the other thing is, Phil. You know, you can also decide what you want to read of a review. I mean, you might decide that you want to leave out the how to and the technical sections of our reviews and and jump straight to the yeah, uh, performance because performance is usually the area which is easier to understand and is written in sort of english that everyone gets yeah yeah and it can be a little bit more subjective there as well um so yeah the buyer's guide do your research is what we're saying um that is important don't just dive in um, um especially if you're going to be spending um a, a significant sum on your next tv and People will do that, and and this is, um, I think, again, we've got distinct camps here, but when you're thinking about five years or 10 years that people are hanging on to these product stools, um, and certainly speaking to our retailer friends uh, who are actually out there in, on the other side of the fence as well, people do tend to up their budget for their TVs in certain areas because they want that TV to last them the five to 10 years, so they want to future-proof, really. Yeah, they'll probably, and you know, a lot of them will go for the for the top end model because they know they're going to keep it for five years, and um, they've got to be they've got to be happy with it. Um, it. There's nothing as worse as you know buyer's remorse, um, and finally you bought a product that uh, doesn't meet your needs um, in a couple of years' time. So I guess there is that. I um, mean, the other thing is, and I do speak to people. You know, I go around all the country and I calibrate for lots and lots of different people. Um, some some people will will only. 
they'll only buy a new TV every five years and they'll only dip into AV forums every five years. Um, you know, I ask a lot of people say, well, you know, I don't want to be, um, I've bought this TV now and I don't want to feel, again, that buyer's yeah. remorse that I should have bought something out. else. Yeah. yeah, a fear of missing out, et cetera, as well. So again, if you've been out of the loop for five years, coming back to the forums and having to get, you know, what is the, what is MLA? You know, you, you know, five years ago, MLA wasn't even a thing. Um, so um, I guess there's a lot of the people coming to the forums uh, and, and trying to catch up with what's been happening. Um, and these threads move at a pace yeah. as yeah. well, you know, so it's, um, I, I, you know, I don't know whether we can do something to, to help those people reintegrate um, and to, uh, you know, get back into the swing of things. Re but uh, AB Forums reintegration camps. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Jules, do you also yeah. get people regretting not having bought a big enough TV? I mean, I hear anecdotally yep. that that comes up uh, yeah. a lot. So. There's, there's always regrets over size, always. Yeah, when did, didn't they used to works. say about on computers, you know, think of how much memory you need and then double it. Um, and, and a similar thing as well. Um, uh, we've obviously seen this, you know, progressively over the years. That sc screen size has gone up, you know, hugely. Um, we all remember our first twenty-eight inch CRTs and thinking they were massive. Um, mm. Well, they were certainly heavy, um, but um, yeah. but I'm now we're talking. I didn't review back then. Yeah. Well, now we're talking, you know, um, sixty-five, seventy-seven inch, eighty-three inches, becoming yeah. much more common. Um, so um, I, I guess um, as long as your other half is you know uh, if you have another half of course um is uh, open to the uh to uh you know um uh, a bigger size of of tv then then i was trying to avoid that i saw that coming down the road i was trying to think, i was trying I to find some other that, words yeah you want straight of that cold you said didn't you? Was, there was no way out um <laughs> But um, but uh, yeah, uh, it, it, that's often the restriction, though, isn't it? You know, um, uh, it, my wife presumably she, she, she would like we go away on holiday and she sees these twenty-inch TVs in the sort of rental places. She says that's the kind of TV size I want, uh, and she thinks our fifty-five-inch OLED's too big for the room. And I'm thinking like, mm, yeah, you know, it's, we should go for a sixty-five at least. Um, so there's there's negotiations domestically to be had with that kind of conversation yeah. too. And of course, you know, Martin. Um, this subject is confusing for a lot of people because you've got to consider so many different things. And we sometimes make fun of the box stickers, but actually knowing which boxes you want to take will help you find the TV, the perfect TV for you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've got a TCL 65 inch at the moment, which is absolutely perfect for my day-to-day -day TV watching. I do my critical movie watching in my cinema room, but I love having one that I can just fire up Netflix on or yeah. one of the apps and watch a bit of daytime broadcasts or evening regular TV broadcasts as well. So yes, in that in those terms, so I don't need a very high-end TV in my living room and I'm very happy with what I've got for the price. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, do your research and uh, go and, and find out what is the latest technology and then... Do you need it? Um, we all like to think that we have the latest and greatest, but actually, if you don't need MLA technology, you don't need um, a TV that's great in darkroom viewings because you don't live in a grading suite or you're not interested in reference picture quality and so on, um, then you know, you, you're you open to looking at last year's TVs um, because you're not going to lose much in terms of image quality. You know, image quality does, does not go up in leaps and bounds every year. They're all incremental improvements. A lot of features that you see mentioned on TVs as well are, are pure marketing uh -huh. um, and nothing other than marketing. They're adding sharpness and calling it super ultra sharpness six or whatever. Or, you know, they'll come up with some fancy name that, oh, this TV does this ultra resolution upscaling um, or ultra smooth motion or, or, or these things similar to that. It's all marketing at the end of the day. Um, so just be aware of that as well. What is marketing and what's actually a useful feature um, is another you know minefield for people to get through. And hopefully our reviews and our articles and, and the owner's threads there with people who have gone and bought the TVs, hopefully this helps you narrow that down as well. And you, you can start to build a, a picture, pun intended, of what it is that, that you want uh, as a TV. And then, like I said, there's two sides of this market that I see anyway, Jules. There's the end who want to know what it is, tick the boxes, have the technology that they want, image quality to a certain level. And then you get the 
what's the best TV under 500 quid side of the market. And when you're looking at 500 pounds and below, you're exclusively talking about an LCD TV. And the advice uh, for that end of the market is they're all going to be much of a muchness um, at 500 pounds. That's not to say that they're bad TVs, uh, but you've got to be aware that you're not going to get huge net numbers, even on an LCD TV at that level of the market. You'll be lucky to get three or 400 nets um, out of a TV. And again, nets is another thing that's come on the scene and confuses people and to think, oh, hell, this TV's got 5,000 nets is going to you know burn my retinas. That's, that's a whole other subject. But at this level of the market, you will get some features that are useful. So if you're looking at the lower end, rather than just walking into a supermarket, which is what a lot of people actually do, they'll, they'll go into the supermarket, they'll pick up a TV off the shelf at 400, 500 pounds. They won't read any reviews. And there's nothing wrong with that. They just want a TV that they're going to shove in the corner. They'll take it out of the box. They won't touch the, the menus or the image or anything like that. And that's fair enough. That's that's the mass market uh, out there. there. There is a large market like that. Um, and no matter how much education we try to put out there in terms of showing people how to make the picture that little bit better and so on, there, there's a huge area of that market, Jules, that are just not interested. And, you know, I'm like that with, with certain things, you know, I, you could take me into B&Q and I'll glaze over, you know, because DIY is not my thing and mm -hmm. I'm not interested in, in drills and drill bits and all that kind of thing. But um so you're going to have that that sector that they just want a TV, they just want to watch it and, and so on. And and that's fair enough. And, you know, we're not criticizing anybody that's like that out there because we're exactly the same when it comes to other other areas of, of life or technology or whatever. But for those who want uh, a little bit of quality, they want to know that they're buying something good, they want to know that, that, that things are going to last a few years. For you, what are the important criteria that they should be looking at when it comes to a product, Jules? But I'm presuming that um, I mean the, the, those in the main are our forum um, users. Um, they are looking for again a, a, a TV that's going to have um, the best black levels. We, there's an understanding that the contrast is extremely important to the uh, quality of the image they're going to get. Generally, they're going to gravitate towards OLED, as we've probably seen in in the polls that uh, we've been running as well. The um, the inclination towards OLED among AV forums users, um, you know, they, they're going to want, it's going to fall down into to two categories there. As we said before, the, the, somebody wants the latest and the greatest, the, 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 the brightest nits level, you know, available with um, probably a G4 or you know, a Sony A95L or whatever else. And then you're going to have the people who, um, as you say, are going to be happy with maybe an 800 nits, C3 or something like that. You know, it's it's difficult to say, uh, Phil, because we have such a range of people. You've just hit the nail on the head. Yeah. That's, that's kind of what I was pushing for. So there, oh, is thank no you. Such thing. <laughs> there is no such thing as a perfect TV. And you've yeah. just put that point, you know, by trying to list the things that, that people should, you know, I think the important thing here, Martin, is uh, you as a user, you as a buyer, figure out what you want. Are you a gamer? You know, do you, mm -hmm. do you need 4 HDMI 2.1? Because immediately that knocks a lot of TVs off your list if that's really, really important to you. So as as a buyer, um, you're going to have your own tech list there and, and you're going to look for what it is that you want. Yeah, some manufacturers actually use those kind of schemes to help you identify which product you use. Admittedly, that tends to be PC manufacturers, but actually it might not be a bad idea for TV manufacturers to do that. You know, you start with a clean slate and then you move through a questionnaire with them. What do you need? What's important to you? And then uh, suggest a few products at the end of that process. Yeah, yeah. of course, it doesn't have to be manufacturers. You know, we, AV Forums is great for that. Oh, yeah. We're banging on, we're banging yeah. on about AV Forums today. But yeah. when it comes to buying a product, you know, it's a great resource. And, and of course, you can find a lot of that as well um, through the website. So just wrapping up on, on this part of the podcast before we quickly go into the polls, is there anything that, that we're missing here, Jules, that you think is, is maybe important for people to consider when it comes to when it comes to buying a TV? Should they think about warranty? Should they think about burning? Are, are these actually issues that you should worry about? Um, burning certainly was. Um, it's certainly less so much now. And I know that some retailers do give uh, not just a five-year warranty, but you know a burning warranty too. Um so if that peace of mind, particularly, I guess, if you're a gamer, again, that's at the back of your mind as well. 
maybe you've got some static images sitting up there for quite a while when you're gaming and you want to make sure you, you just want that sort of that sort of guarantee that um should anything get burnt in you're going to be covered um so yeah i mean those depending on your usage that's going to be important to you um if so um again other things like operating systems as well you know you're going to live with this for five years um, if it's difficult to get to where you want to get, you know, if you want to, if you need the YouTube videos or uh, to Prime or whatever, uh, can you get there simply? I mean, um, certain methods of operation could irritate you after a while if you've got to keep, you know, it's yeah. it just just a few extra buttons. But uh, um, you know, it's it's ease of use. We're looking for ease of living, and uh, we want our our TVs again to sort of. You know, mesh in with our sort of modern lifestyles. You know, you shouldn't have to sort of stand on one leg and stick your finger in the air to get to to to, to the content you want. Yeah, and so, it's, it's good to see manufacturers actually taking that on board. You know, there's there's two or three this year who are guaranteeing that they will update your TV for the next five years and make sure that it's uh -huh. current for the next five years as long as hardware dependent. Um, in terms of updating their, their smart systems, I know LG are running a. A scheme where they will update your TV every year, that your web OS will get updated um, after the, the new models come out. Um, so things like that, yeah. you know, you're going to have your TV for five years. Then you get that little bit of peace of mind that if you go with certain brands, the, they are guaranteeing to you that they are going to, to keep the TVs updated. Right. Let's uh, move and, on and to the I'm sorry to say, just to, to that point, Phil, um, you remember the days when we all rented our televisions. Um, yeah. And I came across somebody recently who, who also rents his TV. And I thought, I didn't think this was still a thing. But it allows him, his rental agreement, to actually have the latest model every single year. So if you are somebody who, you know, you could just return your G3 and get a G4. Uh, so if you're somebody, you know, who's who's into having the latest and the greatest, maybe that model, rather than purchasing, renting, mm. uh, and swapping it every year, something that... that um, I had no idea be... you could still do that. Yeah, I, I had no idea I, I, either. But this, this person did it. I can't remember what company it was. But um, it yeah. seemed like, you know, that's... That could be a reasonable model for, for somebody. Yeah. Also, some so, retailers do very um, preferential um, warranty. I mean, I think John Lewis, I don't know if they still do this, but if you had a catastrophic failure of a TV, they would yet let you apply the price of that TV within the five years to a brand new set yeah. and then extend the warranty again. So Yeah, yeah no, th there are some good deals out there um, and warranties and so on. So yeah, that, that is an important thing to think about as well, where you buy your TV and find a good dealer. There's nothing better than finding someone um, who will demonstrate the TV to you, will let you play whatever material you want on there. And don't be scared to... You know, if, if you're into odd things that you like to watch on your TV, don't be scared. Go go and test it don't test it on just demo equipment and demo clips because that's not telling you anything about how you're going to use the tv so think about what is it you watch and take some demo footage with you and that kind of thing and find the dealer but we need to move on swiftly now because we're going to quickly go through the poll results that we posted to uh, x and youtube um we posted the same questions we're going to give you some of the the rough numbers here in terms of the answers but why, the first question was what is the most important factor in your next tv purchase so we had 68 uh, replies on x at the time of this podcast 104 on youtube at the time of this podcast and they were both very very similar in the 60 percent range um in terms of the latest tech and features is what they go for and uh, in the, the 30 to 40 percent range in terms of value for money so definitely the tech um and latest tech and features went out over value for money uh, there, so um, there you go. I, I thought value for money would be a, a lot stronger, but then that's maybe talking to our audience there, um, out there on YouTube and, and X as well. Um, that's what's important to them. Um, question two, uh, Jules, do you want to do this one? Yeah, how often do you replace your main TV? Um, and um, again, sort of a remarkable similarity in responses between Twitter and YouTube, roughly around um, every year, was just one percent um on twitter um so uh interesting and then every two to three years uh, of uh, between 14 and 20 percent and then every five to ten years around uh, 60 uh 62 to 68 percent so um yeah and then the last the last segment is only when the tv packs in when it stops working and that's around 18 percent um, it's it isn't it funny how close these results are two completely it is. platforms but yeah very very similar there so number three let's uh Let's go over to Martin for this one. Uh, so question three, if your TV breaks down, do you consider having it repaired? 
And the Twitter slash X responses were yes, 44%, and no, 56 So almost half and half. And compare that to YouTube, again, very similar, but weighted towards no. So yes was 47%, and no was 53%. Yeah, very, very, very close to call on those ones. So, yeah, um, I guess having it repaired, it, it's nice to see people considering that, even if it is the the lower figure there, because you know I think recycling is 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 a thing. You know, let's not just throw these things away. Let's but, try and fix them. So, presumably yeah. these are, these are TVs that are out of warranty. I mean, if it's in warranty, you're going to get it repaired. I, I don't, I don't think we went. A specific, yeah. but yeah, if it's under warranty and it's, they're, they're going to pay for it, then absolutely get it repaired, uh -huh. first of all. Um, right, so question four was uh, the purpose of your new TV um, uh, and main TV upgrade. Uh, so X responses, 81 responses at the time of this podcast, 152 on YouTube. When we asked the questions, replace the TV uh, over five-year-olds, 46%, or between 44 and 46%-ish um, between the two. Uh, moving to a different display technology was around about the uh, 18 to 22 percent and then get a larger screen size, which was uh, quite a large number. And we're seeing that uh, in the marketplace as well. So you're looking at around about 30 to 40 percent um, of people are looking to get a larger screen size. That's why they are re replacing uh, their screens there. Um, so, yeah, it's again, another interesting response there to to the questions. And. I guess a little bit, these are, are, are what we'd expect to get back. But again, um, it, it is interesting to actually see. And there, there are good numbers here. Uh, question five, Jules, I don't know if you want to do that, but you had 92 on, on X and 133 on Twitter. So again, a good pool of people. Yeah. How many TVs are there in your household? Um, just the one, around 20%, uh, two, around the 30 to 33%, and uh, three, 25 to 29 percent and four or more is around 20 percent so um two to three two to three tvs is the most uh popular um and we've only got yeah. one out one in our household but we've got lots of laptops <laughs> sitting on laptops they're everywhere uh okay and question number six martin what did we get uh, response wise there uh question number six is what is your next tv purchase likely to be uh for the twitter Responses, we had 85 in the poll and YouTube uh, 179. Um, next TV purchase likely to be OLED 70 to 77 percent. And that based includes on Q both that, those. Yeah, that includes QD OLED in there just to just to Yeah, sorry, that. including QD OLED. Uh, Mini LED, which includes LED, LCD and QLED is nine nine percent actually quite low on the twitter x responses oh. but 20 percent on youtube and don't know yet 21 percent for twitter and don't know yet three percent on youtube so a little so, bit more disparity in that one yeah quite a bit but then you know, you're almost doubling uh, the responses there as well Correct. so yeah so yeah i mean that, that gives yeah, bigger sample, but and again, mini LED that that just encapsulated all the different names for that technology that was out there um, as well. So, yeah, that, that's interesting seeing. But I guess, Jules, we shouldn't be shocked by the fact that mini LED, LCD, QLED, QNED, um, they not not getting as strong as sales now because of OLED, and I think people are are, are seeing OLED picture quality you now and, and moving towards that technology. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, there was a bit of um, excitement, wasn't there, if you can call it that, at the CES announcements of TCL and Hisense about their new milli mm -hmm. LED uh, TVs. And there was a lot of forum discussion about, is this the end for projectors? Um, so it's quite interesting in the light of that to actually see that um, the, the, the responders to this poll are, are still predominantly sticking with OLED and that, that mini LED is sort of not, not, in their, not so much in their plans uh, for next yeah. year. Um, and that, that might again again speak to um, the the what I what I pick up from the forums, which is that um, so many of our forum users uh, appreciate the the, the self-emitting nature of the OLED pixels and the ability to 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 give that uh, contrast on a pixel level rather than mm -hmm. on a zonal level. Um, yeah. So black level is so so important. Um, yeah. But again, you know, getting back to the perfect TV side of things you know mini led is going to suit a lot of use cases a lot of people um you know if they are uh, uh, a little bit concerned about 
uh, burning and that kind of thing because they're, they're gamers and, and, and into that side of the thing. Then an L mini LED LCD TV might be better suited because they're in bright environment. They never dim the lights and so on. And a lot of these TVs are getting a lot better. Uh, you know, the processing technology we have now, AI technology on board these things. It'll be interesting to come back in a year and ask uh -huh. the same question and see if we're still getting the same responses because um, I, I can see a mini LED just with what manufacturers are, are prepping for this year. Uh, there's going to be a push back again with that technology to suit certain use cases. So it'll be interesting to see exactly what happens with that. So the final question, and again, these were just for fun. These were just because we were doing this subject in the podcast. And we thought we'd put it out to our community out there just to get some responses in terms of generalization questions. And this one's, which manufacturer is your next likely TV to be? Now, for me, I, I don't know about you guys, but um, I'm very much technology driven um, and performance driven. And the name on the front um, doesn't usually sway me in terms of uh, uh, brand bias and that kind of thing. I've never been somebody, apart from Ford Mustangs, um, yeah. which is not a TV, you know, that that matters a lot to me. Um, but in terms of technology, I, I'm very much along the lines of performance and, and picture quality and so on. So I've never held uh, any brands in particular um, up highly. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, happy to look at all and, and pick my winner. Uh -huh. But I guess we shouldn't have really be um, surprised at the results here because LG walks away with this uh -huh. quite considerable margin, 106 replies uh, on X and Twitter, um, 206, another 100 responses on, on YouTube, yet the numbers are very, very, very similar. similar in terms of the manufacturers. And, and one, two, three is LG, Samsung, Sony, uh, and then other, uh, not at place number four, um, so you're talking Philips, Panasonic, TCL, Hisense, uh, and on the bottom runs there. And, and I guess that kind of points towards when you look at the sales charts that that backs up in terms of what people are actually buying out there. And of course, LG are, are most known for OLED. And we've just seen that most people going out in question six was, you know, OLED was 70 odd percent. So uh -huh. we shouldn't be surprised with the fact that LG are getting 45, well, 39 to 45% of that market. Yeah. Bill, and, it's and also, course, also, sorry, also. sorry, but I was just going to pick up on your point as well. Um, you know, it's probably better not to be too loyal to a brand because every brand can produce duff uh, products Absolutely. every so often. Uh -huh. And that's why you come to AV forums is to make sure you don't fall into any of the traps. But every manufacturer is guilty of it, of producing good stuff and bad. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh -huh. But again, Jules, I, I don't think we're surprised by the result here, are we? And, and especially when you go out and actually see what people are buying. Yeah, and I think, again, if you're looking at LG, um, they're a good proportion of those people probably be buying it because of its gaming reputation as well. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of heavily weighted towards them. And of course, it uh, you know only remains for for for, for the likes of Sony, etc., to to up their excuse the pun, up their game in this respect and um, to match the capabilities there. Um, yeah, I think so, if Samsung if Samsung got rid of this B in their bonnet with Dolby Vision, I think they would, mm, they would increase yeah. their sales. It's you know. It seems a very, very strange thing, but that's a, a, a subject for another day because we've run out of time once uh -huh. again on uh, the TV display and calibration edition of this podcast. Thank you very much for your replies to the polls. We all run those uh, every week, uh, so do get involved. And, of course, if you've got any questions, queries, comments on what we've been discussing in this podcast, then get them in on the usual way. Either go to AV Forums and leave your comment there. Or if you're watching YouTube, comments down below, uh, and uh, we'll answer them in the next podcast. Our next episode is the Home AV edition. It's Monday, the 18th of March. And, of course, all our Monday podcasts go out at 7 p.m. on YouTube and a little bit later, uh, audio only from your usual suppliers. And that's it for this week. Uh, if you feel like we deserve a coffee, then you can buy me a coffee.com forward slash AV forums. I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much for watching and listening. Thank you to the guys today and we'll see you in the next one.